All right, so uh, let's just wrap up our discussion uh, of a telescope. So practically speaking, uh, if the object is from very far away, uh, the intensity will be very, very faint, right? So the way to uh, compensate uh, the faint intensity uh, is that we need a large diameter uh, for the objective length. And this is practically done um, through this two lens configuration. So instead of having lenses, uh, we make use of the mirror instead. All right. So here are the parallel rays that come from distance objects like stars, and uh, they get reflected. So here, this big lens is the concave mirror, which plays a role of the objective lens that we saw last time. Where this secondary uh, lens uh, would then converge the image uh, through the eyepiece and get to your eyes. And the second configuration, uh, very similarly, is shown on the right. <coughs> All right, so what's uh, relevant for, uh, I think, most of you uh, who may one day become a doctor is a telescope or a microscope, sorry. Uh, so the configuration of a microscope is very similar to the telescope that we saw last time which consists of an objective lens and an eyepiece, which is shown on this figure here. Uh, but what's, what is the difference compared to the telescope uh, situation that we discussed last time? So now the object is much closer, right? Instead of observing a distant star, now the object is much closer, and uh, the objective image is no longer at the focal plane of the objective lens. All right, so instead of forming an image in, at the uh, focal plane of the objective lens, uh, right now, I mean, in this case, the image, the objective image is formed right here. This is denoted by uh, I1, which is the objective image. Is a microphone on? Yes? All right. And then uh, this image uh, is viewed through the eyepiece. So the final image, uh, once again, is uh, virtual, and it is in inverted, and it is formed at uh, this location, denoted by I2. All right, so what is the magnification in this case? The magnification would depend upon two factors. First of all, uh, the first image, the objective image, get magnified. So there is a magnification factor associated uh, with this first image. And that's given by M0, which is a ratio of uh, HI, uh, the size of the image, divided by the size of the object. And we already derived last time this is given by uh, d sub i, uh, the distance between the image and the lens, uh, to the distance of the object. And what does this negative sign tell, tells us? It is inverted, right? All right, so practically, uh, the lens between the objective lens and the eyepiece, uh, which is denoted by L in this diagram, is much larger compared to the focal lenses of the objective lens and the eyepiece. So in this case, uh, we can approximate it, uh, d0, the distance of the object to the objective lens, uh, roughly as the focal lens of the um, objective lens. And this distance, d sub i, can be approximated as L minus Fe, which is a focal length of the eyepiece. So I just put that uh, back into this expression. This is the final result for the first magnification factor 
<coughs> Any questions about this? All right, and similarly, once this image gets through the eyepiece, there's a second uh, magnification factor, which is given by the uh, near point distance n, which is once again 25 centimeters for normal human eyes, divided by the focal length of the eyepiece. So what is the total magnification? They will be the products of the two factors, right? So um, the total magnification is then the products of these two magnification factor. Where we already said uh, this uh, big M sub E, which is a magnification due to the eyepiece, is given by the normal lens divided by the focal lens of the eyepiece. So that's where this N divided by uh, F E factor uh, come from, where this little m0 is given by L minus Fe divided by Fe. And once again, this holds because the distance between the two lenses is much bigger compared to the two focal lenses. So after some simplification, this is your final result. Any questions? All right. So let's look at one example. Uh, suppose you have a compound microscope, as we discussed er uh, just a minute ago, which consists of uh, one 10 times eyepiece and one 50 times objected uh, lens. And these two lenses are 17 centimeters apart. Uh, so what does this two information tell you? This will correspond to the two magnification factors, right? One is little m0, the other is big m0. And what is this 17 centimeters? This will be the L, uh, distance L, that we denoted on this figure, correct? All right, so the question is, what is the overall magnification? Right, that would be the fact, would be the products of these two magnification factors, which give you 500. That's simple. All right, so part B, uh, what are the focal lenses of these two lenses? Namely, what is F sub E, the focal lens of the eyepiece, and what is the focal lens of the objective lens? And the third part, what is the position of the object when the final image is in the fo uh, is in focus with the eye relaxed. All right. So how do you proceed? So first of all, to find out the focal lens um, of the eyepiece, remember it is given by the ratio of the no, uh, the near point uh, distance, 25 centimeters, divided by F sub e. So if I move F sub e to the other side, given that now I know the magnification factor associated with the, uh, associated with the eyepiece, which is what? Which is 10 times, right? So I just take 25 centimeters divided by 10, that would give me the focal length of the eyepiece. F sub E. So once again, I'm just reversing this, inverting this equation. So I move F sub E, which is the focal length of the eyepiece, to the other side, and this magnification factor will be downstairs, right? Any questions? This is good? All right, so I just make use of this relation. That will tell me the uh, focal length of the eyepiece. So once I know that, I can then go ahead and calculate the distance of the object d sub zero, making use of this equation. So once again, where does this equation come from? 
they come from this uh, equation which tells me m0, little m0, which is in magnification due to the objective lens. It is given by uh, minus L, which is the distance between the two lenses, uh, minus the focal length of the eyepiece, divided by the object distance, d0. Right? So now what are the known in this uh, equation? Do we know little m0? Yes, what is it? It's 50, right, given in the equation. So I know little m0, and what else do I know? L is known, it is 17 centimeters, which is the distance between the two lenses. And f sub e is known, because we just calculated in part a. So you can then go ahead and calculate d0, you just solve for d0. Right, you have one equation, one unknown, you can find out what that unknown is. All right, so you just plug everything in. Uh, this is the final result, 0.29 centimeters. But once you know this information, you can then go back and calculate uh, what the focal length of the objective lens is. By making use of this relation, uh, which tells you d sub i, this is a distance between the image and the lens, is given by L minus Fe, which is, once again, shown on this diagram. Right, and then using the uh, lens equation, you can then find out what the focal length of the objective lens is. Any questions? All right, so this is good. All right, so uh, the very last topics uh, before we move on to interference uh, is the lens imperfection. So if I just hand it out a, a, a lens, it's never perfect. It's the real world. And uh, as it turns out, these imperfections can arise in three ways. So the first imperfection, this is uh, called the spherical aberration, which is due to the fact that uh, the rays that come through the lens, they are not really focused exactly at one point. All right, so as, as uh, shown on this figure, uh, what you see is for those rays that come through closer to the center of this spherical lens, uh, they are more focused. However, for those uh, rays that go to the edges of the spherical lens, uh, they are not exactly focused at the same point. So this is called the spherical aberration. So how do you uh, avoid such imperfection? So I just told you, uh, this imperfection arises because the light rays that go uh, toward or go closer to the edge of the spherical lens, they don't really get focused at the same point, right? So in order to avoid this imperfection, uh, one way to do it is to just make use of the cent cent uh, central piece or central part of the spherical lens. Or you can also make use of a, a spherical lenses. All right, so the second, uh, imperfection, the, the second uh, way that this imperfection can arise is called the uh, distortion. So this is uh, indicated in this second um, figure. Basically this arises because um, for rays that go, I mean, for rays that is uh, at different distance from the axis, uh, they don't get the same magnification factor. Is it clear? So you have a center axis uh, of, the, of the lens, but for light rays that are at different distances from this axis, they get magnified by a different factors. And therefore you could uh, get distortions uh, 
in these two fashions. So there are actually applications of uh, such distortion. And you all see those uh, so-called uh, fish eye uh, pictures. Right? The special lens uh, used for camera, when you take a photograph, um, which may uh, lead to such distortion. All right, so the third way this imperfection can arise, is, and this is called the chromatic aberration. Basically, this is a dispersion effect, and, um, and the basic reason for this in imperfection is the fact that re the, uh, the index of refraction would depend upon the wavelength. All right, so what that means is if you pass through the white light, uh, through the lens, and remember the white light would include many, many different wavelengths. For different wavelengths of light, they get, uh, they see a different uh, index of refraction. And therefore, different colors of light ray, they don't get focused at the same point. All right, so this is the third way the imperfection can arise. So this would conclude our uh, this will conclude chapter 33, and we can move on to uh, interference. Recall that uh, the light has a dual nature. It could either be interpreted as particles or waves. There's a dual nature of light. The wave nature of light is manifest in, the, in three ways. One is interference. The second phenomena, which is associated with the wave nature of light, is called the diffraction. And the third uh, manifestation of the wave nature is polarization. So we'll go through this uh, one by one. Recall if you have two mechanical waves, they could interfere constructively. All right, so here are the two mechanical waves. And let's, for simple, simplicity, uh, assume that both mechanical waves have the same amplitude, A. So what happens if these two mechanical waves uh, interfere constructively? Cancels? Doubles. Doubles, right? So what that means is the amplitude of the final result gets doubled. So after constructive interference, algebraically you just add up 
the two wave functions. In the final result, we'll have amplitude twice the original amplitude. So amplitude increases. What happens if these two mechanical waves have destructive interference? You knew the answer. Cancels. They cancel. So for that to happen, what does it mean by destructive interference? So suppose that's uh, the first mechanical wave, Y1. How does Y2 look like? Half of the wave runs away, right? In other words. That would be the second mechanical wave at this moment. And what is the total wave function? They cancels, so it just there's no amplitude at all. Or no displacement at all, sorry. So in this two example here, we have made a very uh, important assumption. Namely, the phase difference between these two mechanical waves is a constant. What is the phase difference in the first case when there is constructive interference? Zero. Very good. And how about the second situation when there is completely uh, destructive interference? Pi, right? Or equivalently, uh, it's one, a half, wave, half of the wavelength. Condition for interference or observable interference is that the source must be coherent, meaning the phase, uh, there's a constant phase, uh, a constant phase, right? Which is, I mean, here I'll give you two simple examples where these two mechanical waves must have constant phase relation. So similarly, uh, with a light ray or two light rays, uh, in order for interference to occur, those uh, two sources, light sources, must have constant phase relation. The second condition for interference to occur is that the source must be um, monochromatic. What does that mean? That means the light source must have one single wavelength.
right, so in the so-called double slit experiment, or Young's experiment, which is the experiment that shows the wave nature of light, has the following setup. So on the left, you have some uh, monochromatic light source. Once again, that's a light source that has a single wavelength passing through double slits. So once the uh, the light reach the double slit, each of the singles, each of those two slits will serve as a light source, a emit. Um, In other words, uh, each of the singles, uh, each of the slits will serve as a point light source, emits spherical uh, light wave. So this uh, light waves coming out of this two point light source would of course propagate, and at some distance away. You have a screen right here, and on the screen you will be able to observe the interference patterns due to uh, the waves coming out of these two light sources. So S1 and S2 here serve as two coherent light sources. And on the screen, which is a distance L away, one will be able to observe the interference pattern. So what happened at the location uh, which is along the central axis on the screen? What would be the pattern observed there? Destructed? How do you find that out? To answer that question, you want to, uh, we need to know like how far, what is the distance uh, the light wave travel, right? Actually, let me not draw this, but. All right, so suppose the light wave that travel from source S1 uh, to point P is given by R1 and the wave that travel from S2 to point P, the distance is R2. So what's the relationship between these two distances if P is located at the center, the symmetric point? They will be the same. So is there a constructive or in, uh, destructive interference? There will be constructive interference. So what happened? What do you expect? Do you expect to see a bright spot or a dark spot? that would be bright, right? Because that's constructive interference. So again, suppose this is point P,
which is located right at the center, the symmetric point, what you expect is R1 and R2 are exactly the same. And therefore, these two waves must interfere constructively. And therefore, you expect to observe a bright spot. away from the center um, downward to some distance uh, which is at location Q here. And suppose the two waves originated at these two sources, they differ by half of the wavelength. So in other words, R1 is half of a wavelength more compared to R2. Then what kind of interference pattern do you expect? Destructive. Destructive. And so you would expect to observe a dark spot. Say it again. No, so they originally, I mean, they, they get originated. Uh, I'm, I'm actually plotting the distance. This is distance, so this is where Q located. All right, and this is Q, where Q is located. Because I mean, you have the wave uh, continuously uh, fitting in, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah? All right, so in this case, uh, at the point Q, uh, these two waves are out of phase, right? They differ by half of wavelength, or uh, pi, and therefore, this is destructive interference, and you e expect to observe a dark spot. So let's just see. Uh, so now, uh, Benny is going to shine a, a monochromatic uh, light source, which is laser. That's a very good light source, which has only one single wavelength, and it's coherent. And uh, the light would then pass through a double slit, and here's a screen, which is very far away from the uh, slit. So let me just try to, don't walk on the stairs, otherwise you may fall. So can everybody see the pattern? <coughs> so what happened in, right in the middle? Is it bright or dark? Bright. And some distance away to the right, you see a complete dark spot, right? Yes. And actually, how many do you see? Many. Many. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, what you observe is they are actually, for, for each uh, bright fringes, uh, you actually see many dark in between. So in other words, there are interference patterns within interference pattern. Right, so we will get, uh, go more into it uh, when we discuss diffraction, but everybody observe the dark spot like some distance away from the center, right? Yes or no? Yes. yes. All right, very good, thank you. Okay, so quantitatively, uh, what are the locations where all these dark spots are located? Hmm?
that the distance between these two slits is given by d, little d. All right, so once again, this is the distance between the two slits. And some distance away, or some uh, L uh, distance away, we have our screen. So suppose at this point, which is a distance y above this uh, central axis. And this is a location where we observe, let's see, which kind of spot do we, do we want? Let's not specify it, but just set up uh, our coordinates uh, first. All right, so f su suppose this is the point of interest, which is some distance y above. Then in order to find out what kind of interference pattern uh, that is observed at this location, we need to know the, the, the past differences between the two waves originated from these two sources, right? All right, so let's do that. All right, in other words, if I know the difference, uh, the difference between this distance R2 and R1, that would tell me, uh, that would tell me the phase difference uh, between the two waves. Yes? And if the difference is an uh, integral multiple of the wavelengths, what do you expect? What kind of interference pattern? Integral multiple of a wavelength. Either zero or one wavelength or two wavelengths. What kind of interference pattern do you expect? Inter uh, constructive, right? So let me just write it down. So I'm going to call the pass difference, uh, I call it delta, which is r2 minus r1. And if this value is integral multiple over wavelengths, then we expect constructive interference and therefore a bright spot. integer, it can be 0, 1, 2, etc. Any questions about this? This is good? All right. And similarly, for destructive interference, what would be the values for uh, delta? Half the wavelengths. So, in other words, this would be lambda multiplied by some integer plus one half. Right? It's either one half or three half or five half that will give you destructive interference. And m here, once again, is some integer. All right, so for the case when this screen is very far away from the two slits, as uh, what we just saw in the demonstration, these three light rays 
are approximately parallel. Everybody agree with this statement? Right, if I keep moving uh, the screen uh, in this direction, those three lines I drew look like as though they are parallel. Yeah? So we can simplify our geometry a bit. Let's see. Right, so once again, if the distance between the screen and the two slits is very far away, then these three lines are as though they are parallel. And that would allow me to write down delta in uh, a simple form. So this is R1, L, and R2. All right, so suppose this angle here, which specify the location on the screen, is given by theta. So you all agree that for a particular distance, above or below uh, the central axis, there is a corresponding theta angle, right? And how do you write down theta in term, I mean, so theta, if it's small enough, this is given by y divided by L for small angles. So if this angle is theta, which specifies the location on the screen, then I know this angle is also theta. Right? If you don't agree, just go home and draw the picture nicely and convince yourself. All right, so the past differences, delta, is nothing but this distance, and remember this is 90 degrees. So this distance will give me delta. And how do you express uh, delta in terms of this angle? D sine theta, very good. All right, so I think uh, probably let's stop here and then continue um, Friday.